So this is no laughing matter for me. You know, to have people come to my come to me and threaten me with perhaps a fatal car accident that extended to my family, that's when I decided I wouldn't stay silent anymore. Someone needs to be held accountable for that. Basement. With us tonight is an old friend, Kaz Clark. She uh, encountered, well, what we would refer to as a UFO uh, in Penturk. Am I still saying that right? Penturk? That's right. Yes. Penturk. Okay. Awesome. Penturk, Wales. Um, and Kaz, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I know you have updates for us. It's midnight your time. You are a real trooper. Thank uh, you. I know you're doing the, uh, the U S tour. So is this now, are these now your new hours? Yeah. Yeah. I, I I'm practically up all night these days, um, over here. Um, I've got a, quite a few interviews lined up in the States, so you'll probably see me on other shows. Um, but I really want to bring you up to date with what's been going on over the last eight years since 2016 and this event actually happening. Yeah, I would love that. Uh, and, and let me tell you, and, and Bob knows this, your episode with us, even though it was several years ago, is and still remains one of our most popular and downloaded episodes. Um, back then, we were not doing video uh, podcast. It was all audio, but we did take the audio, put a static background image and upload it to our YouTube channel. And even that to this day gets continuous views. Um, yes. so, you know, people are very interested, but for those of our listenership who are relatively new and may not have heard about the Penturk incident, can you just give us a very quick synopsis of, you know, what happened? Okay. Uh, it started in February of 2016, on the 25th it started. Um, we had a huge military build-up, and uh, the military knowingly and expectantly set an ambush for a huge pyramid interdimensional UFO, the Jettison smaller craft. And now we know that they shot several of those craft down. Uh, there's been a, an eight-year investigation that's gone on into this case. Uh, we have the evidence. We can prove this case. And I believe that it's one of the biggest cases, not only in the UK, but very possibly the world. So um, just to rehash some of the details, one of the things that was very interesting and kind of foundational is that you uh, and folks that um, your, your friends that uh, live in the area around you had seen and heard this plane, this military aircraft, and I think RAF, circling around the area, and you live in a farm, mostly farm community, rural area, yes. where you don't have military aircraft over there for any reason. Well, we have RAF St. Athen about 14 miles away. Okay. And we do get military aircraft that pass through. Right. But they don't tend to stay. And yeah. I noticed a small propeller plane, very small gray propeller plane, very, uh, flying very low and very slow over the village on the Tuesday. But I didn't pay it any mind because we have RAF St. Anthem down the road. Um, it was the Wednesday when one of my neighbours came out of his house and he was cursing. I won't say what he said, but he wasn't happy because this, this small aircraft had kept him awake all night. And it was then that we started to notice the behaviour of these uh, this one particular plane. And it was circling. Just very, and I just remember thinking, if it goes any slower, it's going to fall out of the sky. And a bit later on, another plane, almost identical to the first, turned up to take its place. And that started to fly in figure eight formations. And then all Wednesday night, that's all I could hear. You know, when someone points a sound out to you, you kind of sit there and anticipate when it's going to come back. Well, that's exactly what happened. Every 15 minutes, this small prop plane, and because I live in at a very quiet neighborhood, it's extremely loud mm. when you've got a small prop plane flying over your house every 15 minutes. So Wednesday night, I had a very restless night. Going into Thursday morning, it was still there. And the, another plane, these two aircraft would swap places with each other. So they never actually left the airspace unwatched. We had written to the Ministry of Defence. We had no response. We had written to Wells Online, which is our local, or I should say our mainstream media here. Mm -hmm. And... They, too, did not respond. So we decided between us, and it was 
myself and all of my neighbours, that clearly they, they were watching for something. And David, who's a bit of a, a plane spotter, shall we say, was quite adamant that they were watching for Russian planes again because it had only been the week before that our RAF, our Royal Air Force, had turned away two Russian Tu-160 bombers from our airspace. So he was quite excited that that's what they were waiting for because it was clear they were watching for something. And we decided amongst ourselves that if the small aircraft was there later, that we would go out and watch with them. I'm not a ufologist. I right. was never a ufologist, and I'm still not. I'm a truth seeker now. Um, but we never expected to see what we saw. Yeah, and so it, it's really interesting because, you know, the idea that we get is that they somehow knew, and I'm just rehashing based on memory here, that this craft that was a giant pyramid and jettisoned smaller craft eventually kind of appeared out of, yeah. it's almost like it entered our dimension in front of your yes. eyes. And it's yes. like they knew this was going to happen and were circling the area waiting for it to happen. And yes. once it did, they essentially attacked the, the, uh, the military aircraft. Yes, they, they, they pursued the, uh, the, when the pyramid first emerged, because that's what it appeared, it emerged out of the darkness. Like it came through a black veil into our dimension turning very slowly anti-clockwise and as it did to, did so came down and in the upright position and once it was in the upright position it fired this really bright green object out of the top and I didn't know until recently what shape that was because it was so bright but we have witnesses now that saw that in Smilog Woods on the ground wow. um, so we now know what shape it was the military pursued that bright green object because that was different to all the other barrel-shaped objects that came out of the craft. Um, we didn't know where the pyramid went. It, it was almost as if it went back the way that it came into the ether, into this fabric around us. But it was spotted earlier in the evening and later that night in North Wales. And they did actually close the entire Welsh airspace, so not just South Wales the whole of Wales, and that was seen making an escape in Colwyn Bay in North Wales, uh, flying in an arc and up into space. So we know that that got away at least, but as for the others, they didn't. So yeah. for all our new listeners, what do you know what episode number our original interview is? I don't remember, but I will link to it. It's one of <coughs> our you know early episodes. I will link to it in the show notes, uh, both YouTube and the audio uh, podcast, so they can go back and listen to the full details. Um, so yeah, so that's the basics of it. Uh, it was like they knew yeah. this was going to appear, and we've heard this from actual uh, ufologists in recent times, as a matter of fact, that there is um, this theory, or I don't know if theory is the right word. There's some people who claim to know that our governments have a way of detecting when these things are going to come and they yes. will deploy. And we've heard from David Grush and others that there are these crash retrieval programs and it's possible that the, it's more than crash retrieval. It's causing the crash and then doing the retrieval. Yes. So Ross was kind enough to tell me that the military are actually monitoring for a frequency to know when these craft are, quote, going to appear, not come down from outer space. And they're using the satellites in order to do that. And there are 28 task forces worldwide watching for these things 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Wow. And if you know what a task force is, uh, it consists of absolutely anything and everything they will need, from nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers to military helicopters and troops on the ground. So before we get into the updates that you have, do you have a theory as to what's going on? What, what do they want to do when they come here? And what are the military, what is their purpose? One of the um, comments that was left that I really got drawn to, shall we say, was a comment that was left by a military personnel who said, glad you've seen keep watching, more are coming. They come for what's theirs. Mm. What do we have that belongs to them? Mm. 
babies. Do you have an answer for that or? Well, it's only a theory. Yeah. But there was an implication that the Royal Mint was involved. And the Royal Mint is one of the most protected buildings anywhere in Europe. And it wouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility that if we did have something that belonged to them, that we'd keep it in one of the most secure buildings anywhere in the world. Mm. Interesting. We just don't know what that is. No, well, the military used to do the security for the Royal Mint. But in June of 2016, that changed. So whatever it was, they've moved it. Mm. Oh, interesting. You think it's a being or a craft or? No, I don't think it's a being. And I don't think it's a craft. I think it's some kind of artifact. Interesting. Oh, I'm so desperate to know. <laughs> yeah, I wish we did know. Well, there's a lot to get through. There's um, these, these craft, whatever they are, are new. These pyramidal shaped craft. Well, tetrahedrons, actually, because they're three-sided, not four-sided. Okay. Um, you know, there must be another line of communication going on. There was one over the Pentagon, one over the Kremlin, one over Berlin, one over China, um, over the public buildings. Now, they must be another line of communication for them to know the importance of these buildings. Right. Yeah. So... Um Back when we first talked, there really wasn't much of an investigation outside of your efforts, if I remember right. correctly. So what's changed since then? Oh, goodness, everything's changed. We've been able to identify the aircraft that were involved. Um, the small gray propeller planes are actually part of a program called I-STAR, which involves the E3 sentries. Um, so those two are actually linked we have their radar returns and everything else. Uh, we have graphics that I've sent to you of yes. the pyramid and the barrel-shaped objects that approached us. Uh, there's also the cover story from the mainstream media where they said that this was just a military exercise. Um, and my comments that I made on the morning of the 26th of February, uh, where I categorically stated that it was not an exercise because I saw it. And since then, they've changed their story. And they've changed it from a military exercise to a police counterterrorism exercise. Mm -hmm. And we asked the police on numerous occasions, and they tried to hide behind national security and law enforcement as their valid exemptions for not answering me by saying that no police counterterrorism exercises are ever made public. Um, so I sent them a link of the assistant commissioner herself giving a running commentary of the police in action during one of their police counterterrorism exercises in London uh, because they absolutely refused to answer me. And I took them to the information commissioner's office and held them in contempt. And that was the police facing criminal charges for not answering me. Good for you. Because they're not the law. They're there to uphold the law. And somewhere along the line, it's become very twisted. Uh, and that was them facing two years in jail, a £5,000 fine, or both, for every single one of those police officers that failed to answer me. And they did have to answer me. And there were no police counterterrorism exercises either. Mm. We've had it from the Secretariat of the Ministry of Defence themselves. There were no exercises in South Wales in February of 2016. So why did they have... 3.8 billion pounds worth of equipment here, or $4.5 billion worth of equipment, 20 helicopter gunships, uh, C-17s, C-130s, two E-3 sentries, one of which was from NATO, fast jets, Chinooks, you name it, they had it in the air that night and all mm. at the same time. This was not an exercise. They did not have permission. This was all over private land, not on Ministry of Defence land, and as the crow flies, Senebridge is 40 miles away from here. And they have 240,000 hectares of land if they want to go and blow themselves up up there, they're more than welcome to do so. But when they do it over public land, or sorry, private land, they've got to get special permission from the landowner. 
there has to be a press briefing, there has to be a ministerial briefing, um, and none of these things were done. We've spoken to the Welsh Government, they didn't know anything. We've spoken to local government, they didn't know anything. We spoke to the hospital, they didn't know. The Royal Mint was one of the few people that actually said, yes, we had prior notification. Interesting. Mm. So we asked them for proof of this prior notification, and they said that they didn't have any paperwork, that they were told verbally. Verbally. This is one of the most secure buildings in Europe. There are military-grade explosives going outside, going off outside, and nobody checked. Mm. And they can't prove that they had any prior notification. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting. So where would you like to start with the updates? Um, I've got all your slides here queued up. Okay. Um, well, you can show the cover story if you like, or, or you can show the aircraft that were involved. It's entirely up to you. So I've got them basically just in order of their name. Okay. Um, Those so. are the two aircraft that were involved. Um, and as I say, they're part of a program called ISTAR, which stands for Intelligence Surveillance Target Acquisition Reconnaissance in its macro macroscopic sense. ISTAR is a practice that links several battlefield fu functions together to assist a combat force, not an exercise, and that works in tandem with the E3 sentry planes. Now, we have, uh, I mean, one of these aircraft, the Beechcraft uh, aircraft, is an above-top secret aircraft. We can find out more information about the E3 sentries than we can about that small plane. Oh, interesting. Apparently, it was taken out of service in 2012 and then brought back into service in 2014, having had some major top-secret refit. And its radar systems see in 3D through trees and any anything like that, you know, actually gives you a 3D picture of what's going on. But that was the aircraft that was used at the time that that thing appeared. So could they see it coming? I don't know. Is this the one that was circling? Those, both of those aircraft, yeah, would bunny hop with each other and, and change shifts, if you like, whilst the, the first would go off and refuel. And uh, they, they flew for eight hours at a time. And then one would come and take the other one's place, but the, they never left the airspace unwatched. And so you, you know that because minute. of pictures of the tail numbers? Yes, that are, their call signs and tail numbers are on there. Um, all right, so that, should I go to the next uh, slide? Yeah, you can. These are just some of the uh, radar returns. This is from Jackal 2 and Jackal 1. The, those were both their call signs. And this is flying over Penturk in South Wales on the 25th and the 24th of February 2016. And you can see how concentrated their flight paths are. Mm -hmm. That it continuously flied, uh, sorry, flew over this area uh, nonstop for three days and three nights. And the same with the next slide, which is Snake 48. And that aircraft circled this area. And as the time approached, so that circle got smaller. Oh my God, look yeah, at that. Look at that one. Okay, and once that craft had appeared, um, that small plane, that's ZZ418, went to Smilog Woods and circled the exact crash site. In, which is you not know, obviously no reason for them to be doing this in this area. They have no permission to do this. Yeah. This is all over private land. They had no permission from the landowner. They broke every aviation rule, including minimum heights and minimum safe separation distances. They exceeded a NOTAM that was inserted the following day for the previous night that was never planned. And we can prove that too. And this, this um, imagery comes from like your equivalent of the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration in the States? These radar returns actually come from public flight radar internet okay. radar systems, which they've now, they're not live anymore since this event. Oh, okay. They've shut them down. They're delayed. And you used to be able to go back infinitely, really, in time. And now they've got, a, I think, a few weeks limit that you can go back in time. Mm. So they've, um, they've stopped it. Oh, interesting. So the next slide is, is the E3 Sentry that was here. This is the, the NATO E3 Sentry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 
you wouldn't expect to see a NATO aircraft in a small village like this. But that too was flying very low. And E3 is not supposed to fly very low, but it did. Um, and we do have proof that this was here. And there were two E3 sentries. One was from the Royal Air Force and this one. So this one definitely filmed the whole event and was air command for what went on that night. That sensor array on the top is just insane. Yeah, it's huge. Communicates directly with the satellites. Yeah. I think this is a U.S.-made aircraft, correct? Well, certainly NATO were in charge that night. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy looking. It's huge and very loud. Very yeah. loud. And so this is, you've had a new artist rendition of... Of the pyramid itself. This is just a graphic. Yeah. Um, it's not completely 100% accurate, but it gives you an idea of the size of this thing. Um, we estimate from the, the EMF trail that it left behind that this thing was a 1,000 feet long per side. Mm. Per side. And you, this is what you saw? Yes. Yes. In this much depth and, and detail? Um, certainly the lights around its perimeter, but I could only see that the, the craft was solid around the brightest lights as it neared the ground. Before then, everything was black within the triangles, if you like. But when it neared the ground and ejected this hand of lightning, the bottom lights, or the lights nearest to the ground, um, started to glow really bright white orange from this towel light red. And around the brightest lights, you could see that this was a solid craft and not, for example, just a string of lights. And it was textured, almost rock face. And this was what the graphic designer came up with, but it wasn't in as much detail as that, but certainly around the brightest lights, you could see that it was a solid craft, yeah. So now Ross Coldheart has talked about, and I don't know if you've heard this, but he's talked about how there is a UFO, for lack of a better term, that is so large that they had to build a building around it to... The Vatican. To, the Vatican itself? It's the Vatican, yes. Well, he hasn't said that publicly. Well, he, yeah, well he's never... Yeah, he's never... <laughs> he wouldn't be pressed and said, I'll say it because I'll... You know, I don't care. Yeah. But that's what it is. So when that's interesting rebuild, because he's, he's said that I can't say where this is, but what I can tell you is that a very large structure was built over this giant UFO that is immovable because of its size. You're telling us right yeah. now that it's the Vatican itself. It's the Vatican, yeah. And how do you know that? Just people talk. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've heard, and I've seen some things um, online. Uh, where the suggestion was when they rebuilt St. Peter's Square, um, it was discovered, you know, and that's why they built it bigger than it was before uh, because they built it on the top of one of these things. So what and does that tell been, us about the true purpose of the Vatican and the religion itself? I don't want to get into that. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm sorry, but the church is supposed to be there to oversee that we don't have starving and poor people in the world. Look around. That's all I'm going to say. I'm sorry. The church, you broke up a little bit. The church is there what? To oversee that we don't have starving in the world or poor people, you know, or people in help or who need help. But clearly the Vatican is the richest country in the world. Mm. So something's gone wrong. Yes. Interesting. All right. Um, this is, I remember this from your book, actually. This is right. the depiction. There's a reverse angle there as well from the red barrel over the over the hedge. But this was how close these barrels came to me. Um, I was still stood on the gate at this point. I actually had my right hand raised, not my left. Um, but it was a better camera angle for the graphic. Um, these things were about the size of a small car. I'd say about the size of a smart car, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, completely silent. Uh, and all the insides were moving. And I said at the time, that it was almost as if they were made of glass. But we think that they were made of another substance as 
we have had a new witness that's come forward that drove through some of the debris from these barrels. And what, what do they say? They said it was white and red crystal. Chunks, large chunks of red and white crystal, like quartz. They reflected in their headlights. Hmm. And the military were running around wearing forensic suits, scrambling, trying to pick all this stuff up. So now, do you think... So there was no little green men sitting in these things. Right. I was going to ask if you think that these themselves are some kind of life form, or do you believe that they're craft? Or kind to of me, a mix of both? To me, they, they appeared to be alive. It was almost as if we're connected in some way. Mm -hmm. Like we're part of them and they're part of us. Um, but they were certainly afraid. They tried to hide. They tried to run, but we shot them down anyway. It was awful. And mm. when they drove through, they were already on the ground broken? Yes. Mm. We have witnesses that heard gunfire, but the men that were in Smilog Woods that night didn't hear gunfire. But they experienced and heard the explosion, and it shook the entire mountain. Um, they saw the object on the ground, and they were assaulted, arrested, illegally searched, and kidnapped, taken by force from the woodland that night. And there is no legal mechanism to close a public right of way for an exercise. So this was no exercise. This was real. And we have their testimony. And so have they talked about what the interrogation com was comprised of? It was more about what they'd seen, what were they doing there? Had they got any devices? They took their phones from them. They actually had passcodes on their phones. But it was no problem for the military to get into their phones and reset it back to factory settings. Mm. Mm. So now... So they your, your view of this is that we, the royal we, um, the military, etc., humans, we're the aggressors in this. Yes. What do you think is our angle as the aggressors, just trying to protect whatever it is we have that they're coming back to get? It's more about the technology. It's more about keeping this secret from us at any cost. And is this secrecy going to be to our own demise? You know, what's the point of secrecy if we doom ourselves to destruction because of it? These mm -hmm. things were not hostile. But what happens if they turn out to be? You know, mm -hmm. what happens if they come back with their warships? Is that why we've got a global armed space force now? Right. So but what are your thoughts on that? I mean... If you are a military leader and your job from day one was to protect the homeland, protect humanity, et cetera, and you were told that, you know, maybe they're friendly now, but if they come back with their warships, like you just said, they could wipe us out, you know. It's not very often you see them doing each other over for their own spaceships, is it? You know, and, and we would be foolish and naive to believe all life forms have been benign. The same as we'd be naive and foolish to believe that if the Big Bang is to be believed, that all the elements for life landed on this little speck of dust, you mm -hmm. know, in the middle of nowhere, when those building blocks for life would be absolutely everywhere and not just here, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it's time to open up a line of communication because there was no attempt to communicate with them. They set an ambush, they pursued, and they shot down mercilessly. What does that make us? Are they going to show us the same mercy? Will they differentiate? You know? Yeah. And this is the problem. I mean, they're making decisions on our behalf without even informing us. And that's a very dangerous situation. Yeah. That is uh, concerning. All right, what are we looking at here? This is the news release. Yeah. This is uh, one of the news reports from the Murrow, which is the national paper over here. And it talked about how terrified neighbors were. Um, oh, let me just get that up. 
Uh, terrified neighbours in a country village wake during the night to sounds of explosions and fighter jets. The villagers were terrified when they woke to sounds of explosions in the sky, not on the ground, in the sky. And the second one is from Wales Online, which is how military training planes and helicopters kept parts of South Wales awake. Uh, military aircraft were spotted in the skies above South Wales last night as planes so and helicopters. Before took I move part to that, in a major training drill. This uh, the cool. mi this mirror article is from 26 February 2016. Uh, remind morning. me of the date of the uh, actual incident. The 26th of February 2016. Okay, so this was, was the very next morning. Stories that came out the same morning. Gotcha. The same morning. The same with the Wells Online report. Again, as a military training exercise. And that's also what South Wales police were saying when the members, hundreds of people, phoned the police to find out what was going on because nobody knew. Um, and they were told it was a military training exercise. This was the cover story. And of course, I made my comment on Wells Online that morning because I didn't know you weren't supposed to talk about UFOs. I'm not a ufologist, and I'm still not. I'm a truth seeker. And uh, the slide actually is my comment. And ironically, that I had two debunkers that used two fake Facebook profiles, one of which called himself the smoking man, and the other one called himself Agent Fox Mulder, because they really do like mm. their play on words. They really do like to take the mick. Yeah. And my comment on the morning when I said thanks for sharing, but I can categorically state that this was no exercise. Last night I saw absolutely everything, and what they were chasing were not planes. I will take a lie detector anywhere for what for anyone, but what I witnessed last night will stay with me for the rest of my life. What is more, the military knew they were coming and had two spotted planes in the air for two days waiting for the event. When it came, four planes chased the green object whilst a spotter plane circled approximately six red oval objects which formed a pyramid shape. Several red spheres hovered silently above the fields until the helicopters came. And that was my comment on the morning. And then I had this person using a fake Facebook profile calling himself the smoking man, you know, LOL, good one. Well, I like a bit of sarcasm, so I, I responded to his LOL, good one. And I said it was good, in fact. It was amazing. Actually, you should use the name The Smoking Man. After all, isn't it his job to debunk real events? Answer this. When do they use live ammunition in an exercise in a residential area? Answer, never. And one other thing. You may have chased and shot down the green object. But you didn't get the red ones, did they? Because they were all still here. And then Agent Fox Mulder, also using a fake Facebook profile, Actually, it's my job with Smiley. Mm, interesting. Um, um, and then, of course, after that are some of the comments made by members of the public, which was my starting point at the other end because I wanted to know what had happened to that green object. Um, you know, you can clearly see that people are talking about, you know, the explosions. I'm assuming this is your chopper that kept me awake for hours on end. What's going on? Nightmare, there was an explosion at three-ish, and at one point there were three helicopters. Is there something going over it on Clantrisson at 4 a.m.? Three helicopters circling for hours, keeping us all awake. You know, and these comments went on and on. Um, and this is just a handful of comments from members of the public. This, these were all taken from Wells Online and from Twitter, um, because hundreds of people took to Twitter that morning uh, to complain. Uh, but the interesting one is on the next slide, and that's at the bottom, and that was made by Wales Online. And this was at 3.39 in the morning, and apparently they were still working on a story about this, and they will post the link as soon as they have it. So there was no press briefing, as required by their Training Over Private Land Act on the Defence Training Estates. Um, rules and regulations and the military have rules and regulations for a reason and you follow them you don't break them 
Otherwise, the military would be absolutely chaos. Um, but they did. And, the, the, you know, I can get into that a bit later on because I have some of the rules and regulations and the answers that we were given. So now, did Wales Online publish an article? They did, and you've, that was the one where military training okay. planes and jets kept people awake all night. Gotcha. You know, that was their cover story of a military exercise. Well, the next slide that you see is, is just one of the, the trees that uh, from the debut trail. These trees are 60 feet tall, and the canopies were all snapped off because whatever went into the woods, this is in Smilog Woods, came in at altitude and took all the tops of the trees out until eventually it ended up in the crash site, which is, uh, I've given you one slide mm -hmm. from the crash site, which is next. So um, now what I'm looking at here is this is the trunk of the tree and this is yeah. the canopy that's been moved off to the side because it's been snapped. No, it would have had another 40 foot of tree on the top of it. Okay. And if you look at the actual trunk, at the top of the trunk, you can see that that is snapped. Yeah. And this uh, is November 29th, 2017. So it still hasn't yeah. grown. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, the next slide is are some of the images from the crash site. And so this area you, down here used to be all woods and now it's cleared from the crash? Yes, yes. What you see here are six trees that are at least 12 to 40, 14 inches thick. They're 60 feet long and they've been snapped mid-trunk. Not at ground level, mid-trunk. Now, speaking to witnesses, they estimate that there was two seconds between the explosion over Tlantris and Common and the impact in Smilog Woods. Well, from Tlantris and Common to Smilog Woods is about a mile. Whatever that was, was traveling at 1,800 miles an hour. Mm. And uh, it takes an awful lot of energy to snap a tree. You know, we've had fatal car accidents over here where people have been traveling 90, 100 miles an hour and have collided with a tree, but the tree didn't snap. A little bit of bark has come off, you know, but the tree itself is still intact. Mm -hmm. To snap trees, this many, in a localized area, it takes an awful lot of energy to do that. And these trees are very big, you know. Um... But there were a, a few strange anomalies that, that happened. Um, not only was it snowing at the crash site, it, it was snowing in the field where the pyramid almost touched down, where it emerged, um, and not in the surrounding fields, just in the one field. So now, and at the crash site. was this area cordoned off by the military in the, in the following days? Uh, yes, they were already clearing up. They were already picking up. The, the canopies of the trees. Um, they'd, they'd been there all night. Uh, the men that were in Smilog Woods that night saw the object on the ground. Um, there were three people walking around it in wearing hazmat suits. And they said, because I asked them what shape it was, and they said, if you can imagine an old glass coat bottle with that undulation in the center, uh, with the top cut off, that's what it was like, like it, hmm. like a little figure eight, if you like, which explains the way that it skipped and moved, as opposed to gliding or in a straight line. Um, but they saw that on the ground, and as I say, they were, as he put it, gripped. He said, and Kaz, when I say gripped, he said, I mean gripped. You know, these people were assaulted. Hmm. Um, but those are... Uh, other strange anomalies that, that took place, you know, there was um, a five degree temperature drop at the moment that craft appeared. A That's full five degrees. Wow. And it only snowed there. That's yeah. Right. Okay. And then it went back up again. So the moment that craft came in, the temperature dropped by a full five degrees. So now I need to ask you, this is a little bit personal, but when you came on the first time, you told us how your hair was brown and then after this experience, it turned completely gray. 
and yes, had sir. remained yeah. that way for a while. Now, have you dyed your hair or has it come back brown? No, no, I, I'm a little bit salt and pepper now. I still am. Um, but it grew back its natural color, if you like. Isn't that interesting? Um, but I've since found out, you know, with the the pigmentation and the chlorophyll missing from the plants, uh, that it's some kind of ionized radiation that causes that. Uh, I didn't get an opportunity to speak in detail about that with the person that mentioned it to me, uh, but I'd like to. So apparently it's ionized radiation that causes that. I mean, this incident nearly killed me. You know, in, in 2016, I nearly died. So this is no laughing matter for me. You know, to have people come to my come to me and threaten me with perhaps a fatal car accident that extended to my family, that's when I decided I wouldn't stay silent anymore. Someone needs to be held accountable for that. So those threats came in what form? Well, when uh, a UFO group first got involved, and they came over and did some initial tests. They made the incident public. I didn't want to be public. Um, I put a lot of uh, conditions on them uh, that I wasn't to be named or come forward or photographs or anything like that. But they made everything public, including all the witness names mm, that's messed that up. they knew mm. about at that time. And I had a few people contact me via my Facebook page that had an interest in the case. And could they come out and view the site? A lot of people do. And this one man had contacted me for the same purpose. And I'd spoken to some of the administrators for some of the pages that he was a member of. And everybody said that they didn't actually know him. But he'd been a member of their site for some 18 months which coincidentally was the exact time period from when this incident had occurred. And so I agreed to meet with him, thankfully not on my own. And when I was trying to explain to him and describe what had happened, he wasn't trying to visualize, he was remembering. Whoever he was, he was part of what went on that night. Mm. Asked me what it was I wanted. And I said, well, I don't want anything for myself, which is true, I don't. Uh, I said that, you know, I, I'm really, I don't know what you're worried about. You know, this is just going to be another story like Roswell and like Rundlesham, both of which were real events. And his demeanor changed. And he said, you know, you, you need to be careful because accidents happen all the time. You know, perhaps you'll have a fatal car accident for you and your family. Mm. Uh, he chested up to David, who was the other primary witness, who had his small child with him at the time. Um, but I knew what he meant. And it was an indirect threat, shall we say. Yeah. Mm. Um, and that's when I decided no one's going to threaten my kids. No one. You know, it's my job to protect them. And if I don't, no one else will. Right. So that's when I decided that enough was enough. It's not my fault this happened to me. I didn't make that happen. But it happened behind my house. Right. You know, the same as the military that came here and camped afterwards. Who lied about their identity, by the way. Who were armed. They too. Who did they say they um, were? <clears throat> excuse me. Well, we had different stories, um, and I only knew that they were there because of my local Penturk hub. And some of the residents had said that they were told they were a fracking survey team, which really didn't go down very well in the village. Mm -hmm. And then they said that they were Vodafone doing field research, which is a mobile phone network. I don't know if you've got that over there. We yeah, don't have it. But we've heard we don't it. have Vodafone, but I know Vodafone. Yeah. <laughs> well, that kind of tweaked my curiosity. So I'd gone over with a friend of mine to take my dog for a walk. And um, I saw two soldiers coming towards me, both of which were carrying guns. Now, those guns had never been dragged around on exercise anywhere. They looked brand new, like they'd been stripped and oiled that morning. And they certainly didn't have yellow caps in the end of the barrel. 
and neither were the magazines coloured in any way, so it appeared very much like they were carrying live rounds. And they told me that they were doing a military exercise, uh, bearing in mind that they're wearing digital camouflage, and I believe that's only what the American troops are given, digital camouflage. Mm -hmm. But um, they said they were doing a military exercise in case of an emergency situation. Should we see anything funny going on in the fields? Well, we'd walked down the trail a bit further and turned left into the field where they were camped. And you do have an image of their campsite. And they used civilian tents and civilian vehicles, not military. And I've said all along, you can take the man out of the army, but you can't take the army out of the man. These tents were in perfect straight lines. You know, if I'd gone camping with my friends, I'd have been tripping over the drawstrings in the middle of the night, getting out to use the toilet, you know. these You couldn't get your foot between these tents. They were absolutely perfect. But they didn't use military tents. And if it weren't for these few photographs, there'd be no evidence these people were ever there. There was a complete denial when I asked the Ministry of Defence about them. They said they held no information. So we asked them again, you know, why did they send a clean-up crew after the event? What were they looking for and why were they carrying guns? And again, they double-checked and they confirmed they held no information. So we asked them again because I know the truth. I was there. I saw it. And so no lie, fake cover story or fake exemptions will ever stand against the truth. And eventually, we got a Section 26, not in the public interest. Well, I know that only the military can hide behind Section 26, but I needed them to say it. So we asked them why were the military in the fields of Penturk. And again, we had a Section 26, not in the public interest. Mm. So that just no confirms... no permission yeah. was ever yeah, granted confirmed. for these people. No, for the change of use of that land. This is farmland. There's no plan of permission for any surveys on that land. So you, when you said that you almost died that year, what, what were the, was it radiation or, or what was it that uh, almost killed you? The effects of high EMF. And okay. there are military documents that will outline what happens to people that have been exposed to these craft. But basically it... Um, decided to open up all my veins and arteries and slow my heart right down. And I nearly died. The craft did that? Indirectly. Yeah. It wasn't intentional. It was just because it was so close to me. Right. And do you think because they blew up part of the craft that came out, that's why you were exposed? Like if they would fly over, you wouldn't have been? or The craft came within 10 feet of me. But the radiation that must have been in that field that morning, let's put it this way, the EMF was still so high 20 months after the event. It was still in the microwave level. And beta radiation was also found there. 20 months after the event, it was still a severe concern on the health and safety graph, if you like. Have there been effects on, um, like, the animals and stuff in the area long-term? I wouldn't know about the animals, but certainly there was on the plant life. Yeah. You know, the hedge that the barrels stopped over the top of didn't grow for three years. Hmm. And the bald patch is still bald. Interesting. Oh, still bald. Yeah. So it, people that come to visit there, do they risk having any effects? Or is it, it's clear now? Well, we've been testing it for the last, well, it's almost, it'd be eight years this month, uh, in just a few days. And we've been testing it for seven years. And after about the fifth year, I think it had started to diminish. Um, so I'm not quite sure if there's anything there now, but certainly there was for a very long time. Wow. How do you explain that? So did you eat the local meat? Like at the farm, do you have farmer's markets there? Did you eat? The local livestock or always You've got to support the farmers yeah always 
Yeah. So actually, I skipped over one image. I think you were talking about. It. Is this <coughs> the, the change in drop. temperature? Yeah. Yeah, that was the temperature drop at the exact time that that craft came in. Right here. Now this I spike make down. This up. No. So five degrees, it dropped. Thirty-seven cell. This is Celsius or Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. So from thirty-seven Fahrenheit down to basically thirty-two, instantaneously between one and two a.m. At the moment it came in, yeah. Hmm. And then it gradually goes back up. Or I don't know if if you camp or if you've ever been homeless, but normally four a.m. is is the coldest time of the morning. You know. Yeah, that's right. Chad doesn't talk about his homeless time. <laughs> <laughs> the The next slide will be the, yeah, the illegal the campsite. Yep. And, and then, then this was a letter that was sent out regarding the police counterterrorism exercise that took place in, in June of that year. Uh, even though the police are trying to try to tell me that, you know, police counterterrorism exercises are secret and not in the public interest. They gave everybody a letter and put up posters. And it was this that they tried to merge together with what happened in February. Yeah, I was going to so say it's the wrong month. Took part in February, and then they went to the expense of this police counterterrorism drill. Um, to try. Yeah, and how many terrorists have you had yeah. in in Penturk, Wales? How many? How many terrorists have there been in Penturk, Wales? None. <laughs> right. Zero. Yeah. So do they really hold an exercise on June 28, 2016? They did, yes, in, in Flantricent, in some disused warehouses in a fenced-off area, um, in a contained area, which is where an exercise would take place. And it was filmed, and um, you can see the simulated munitions going off, which is what they tried to say was the cause of the explosion. But I'd like to see them place one in the air. Um, secondly... There wasn't enough smoke from four of those simulated munitions to create enough smoke to resemble a foggy night, which is what the witnesses have told us that were at the hospital, members of staff there. Um, you know, what they used to bring that green object down was absolutely, most definitely a missile. And that was the smoke from a missile. And that's why there was a meticulous metal search carried out on Plantris and Common in what the military calls silent hours, using helicopters and troops on the ground. And in fact, they picked up every piece of metal on that common that night. And we had a section 26 for that too, and we asked them why they conducted that metal search in the early hours. And so now apparently your washing machine and bits of old bike on national security. So I highly recommend to all of your viewers that if you've got a broken down washing machine that you've found your local Ministry of Defence <laughs> or Department of Defence, let them know there's a national security risk at the end of your street. Because that's how pathetic that is. Mm. I mean, clearly they were picking up parts of the missile they fired. Mm. That's what that was about. So let me ask you this, because one of the issues, one of the counter arguments to any, I'll just call it conspiracy theories, and I'm not saying that's what this is, but one of the issues is where the, the concept that so many different people and agencies and everything are involved. So being that this is the South Wales police doing this, potentially at the behest of the Ministry of Defense to hide and whoever else is above this to create this subterfuge of, oh, we do do you know these exercises. Do you think the South Wales police were... Um, aware or like unaware participants in this, they were basically asked to oh, do no. this and then they, they did it, or they knew they absolutely knew, and they've been they're the ones that contrived the second cover story of a police counter terrorism exercise. Because when people they, they rely on people's memories fading, and especially as it's been eight years now, when people look back to an exercise in 2016, it'll be oh, yes, we had a letter. But unfortunately, the real event happened in February, and this exercise took place in June. Yeah, wrong man. And I've called the trust out from the hospital trying to merge these two things together, and I called them out on it. 
and said, I'd like to think there's some confusion on your part. But they too have changed their story and tried to backfill with this counter-terrorism exercise that took place on the 25th and 26th of February 2016. So we um, took South Wales Police to the um, Information Commissioner's office because they refused to answer us and tried to hide behind two exemptions that do not apply and had them facing criminal charges. But so does that mean the South Wales police know that there are UFOs and they know the reality of the Absolutely. situation? Absolutely. We asked about the road closures. We asked South Wales police about road closures because a lot of the roads were closed. Many people had difficulty in getting home. And initially they, they refused to answer us and said, no, it's a vexatious request, which is too much trouble or worrisome to people. We're asking about road closures that happened nearly eight years ago, and they're telling us that's worrisome to people. So we asked for an internal review, and we did get an answer. And that answer is, at, well, if this is the, the level of intelligence, by God, we're in trouble. They actually said, quote, that they could find no information regarding any road closures that night because... The police officers involved have since left the organization. Mm. Well, if they can find no information, how the bloody hell do they know who's involved? Yeah, yeah good point. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Sorry, excuse my language. I don't no, need to that's swear, okay. But... <laughs> this is the basement. We're, we're good with language. <laughs> okay. Um, it's just this, this, and this has gone on, you know. So we know they close the roads. We have multiple witnesses to them closing the roads. We know the military closed the roads. We know now that there were multiple shoot downs and not just, you see that bright green object, the one that was over Plancher St. Common right next to the Royal Mint was different to all the rest. And that's the one they shot with the Apache helicopter. Mm. And the red one got away. You have, you, a, you have um, a picture of, I believe. Um, the, the red, the red UFOs got away. Is that what you said earlier? No, I'm, there were at least three of those that I know that were brought down. Mm. Um, I'd like to think that they got away. We have a witness in Betis in Bridgend, about 30 miles west of here, that saw military jets and helicopters pursuing a cluster of lights. And I spoke to this witness, and he told me, because I said, I know those lights weren't white, so what colour were they? And he told me green. But he said, it happened so fast, Kaz. And that was all he wanted to say on the matter. Mm. So the next um, lots of slides a, are witness statements. I remember a staff at the Royal Glamorgan Hospital. And I'll call him Matt C. And he said, I was working a night shift at the Royal Glamorgan Hospital. I can't be certain what time it was exactly. But there was a loud bang that shook the whole hospital. I ran to the window for I thought something had crashed into the side of the ward I was in. Shortly following, the smell of like sulfur was coming through the vents and seemed to linger all night through the corridors of the hospital. I went outside to try and puzzle what had happened. A smoke seemed to be misting through the air, seemed to come from towards the common, or at the time I thought a factory might have had an explosion of sorts. There were helicopters circling, circling right throughout the night from the early hours at, right up to about six-ish, maybe, in the morning. The only explanation we got later on was from the news that the army were on a training exercise. Mm. Now, the hospital told me, once they tried to change their story, that they told their staff about this police counter-terrorism exercise. Um, but I've got an excerpt, because we asked for some of the phone call transcripts from South Wales Police of the hundreds of people that called in that night, and one of which was from the ambulance service, and the staff at the Royal Glamorgan Hospital, they didn't know. And they were advised then that it was a military exercise. So not even the police knew that it was a police counter-terrorism exercise, because that didn't exist either. Mm. It's a tangled web they've woven, but I'm the spider. <laughs> yeah, yeah so thank God you're here. It doesn't yeah. matter what they say. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This is from a lady called Moira, whose father was a patient at the Royal Glamorgan Hospital on the night, who heard a lot of gunfire, aerial activity, 
and then a huge bang that shook him in his hospital bed. He lived through the war and was an armourer in the RAF. Um, so he knew what he was hearing. He said it was quite unnerving. Mm. This is a veteran in the hospital that night. And that's the Apache helicopter. The one that's, that uh, had to make an emergency landing at the yes, with nearby his airport. On fire. Yeah. Um, covered in stealth paint, apparently. Uh, where you wouldn't expect to see an Apache helicopter um, at Cardiff International So Airport. how do you know that's stealth paint? Because of the color? Uh, no, because of the people that we've spoken to at the airport. Okay. Who work there. Interesting. Um, yeah, I can only send you so much, you know, for the time that we have. Yeah, understood. But that is from the National Geographic Society. On the left-hand side is the explosion that went off at 421. And that's from Monmouthshire. 40 miles away. This was not a simulated munition. This shook people's homes. You know, this was a huge explosion. So during the day, all those, those jumping and sound, is that just like normal air travel? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at night it's so, silent and all of a sudden we have that bump at four. Yes. And then In what the is this here? This, I, I know this is later, but this, there's a fairly big red spike here. What, what what would account for that, do you think? Uh, probably aircraft, to be honest. Okay. Uh, but whatever, we asked about that bump, shall we say, and they told us whatever it was, was man-made. And the only thing that was going on that night was the military. Okay. So that was the... I was quite shocked to learn that that explosion went off at 421 because that means I've lost an hour and a half in time. Is Cardiff an international airport? Yes. Okay. I was going to say that looks like a big British Airways plane there in the background. Exactly what it is. We had a lot of FedEx in and out of there as well. Okay. And so the helicopter went down an emergency landing. Was it hit by something? Apparently the pilots were hanging out of the window because there was smoke bellowing from its cockpit. So was it hit by something or was it just like a normal issue? Perhaps it was too close when it fired the shot and was caught in its own kinetic wave, caught in the explosion, shall we say. Mm. Um, so, yes, I think they learned some valuable lessons that night. Um, we can get into some of the freedom of information, if you like. Um, the next one is from the Ministry of Defence, when we asked why a meticulous metal search was carried out in the early hours of the 26th of February 2016 on Clunch St Common. Uh, what were they searching for? And the Ministry of Defence has withheld this information under Section 26. So again, bits of old bike, bits of old washing machine are now national security and not in the public interest. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the next one, all of these slides have the reference numbers on the top of them. You can go to whatdotheyknow.com and type in those reference numbers and the Freedom of information will come up for you. Is that what we're looking at here? Or am, I on, on my, am I on the wrong slide? You're on the wrong slide. I just hit next. And so. Denial and contradictions. Which is the next one. Keep going, man. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And uh, this is regarding the men that came and camped in the fields. So we asked... I'm writing to request information regarding the military exercise that took place in the fields of Penturk, adjacent to Tinicoid Road, at the rear of the Sarn Estate between the 1st of February 2016 and the 30th of April 2016. Local residents were told they were conducting a military exercise in case of an emergency situation. Why were the residents not told the military were conducting an exercise there? And the MOD holds no records within the scope of our request. So they denied any knowledge of them. That was their first denial. Yeah, so who the hell were they? All right, because later on we got them to admit that they were military, but the point was that to the layman or to someone that was just investigating this case who doesn't have the, um, one of the I don't know what I'm looking for, but first-hand knowledge, who didn't yeah. see it, you know, who didn't see it, who, who don't, d doesn't know the truth, would have accepted that. 
right. the same as, you know, the cover story to cover the cover story. When they dug a little deeper, oh, it must have been a police counterterrorism exercise. That's what it was about. It was secret. No, that's not what it was. Anyway, we go on to the next slide. Yes. Again, these are two separate freedom of information requests. Um, I hope it's not that one. That one. 91, we should be on. Why did you send a cleanup crew after the event? What were they searching for? And why were they carrying guns? And again, the Ministry of Defence's response to our earlier Freedom of Info Information requ request. As stated, the MOD's response dated 24th of October 2018, no information is held in the scope of your request. A further search has been conducted, and I can confirm the MOD does not hold the information in the scope of your request. That's a second denial. So we ask them again. If this was just an exercise, why use the fields of Pentoke when Sanibridge is just up the road in his MOD land? And why were the residents not notified this was happening in advance? And then they said, as stated in the MOD's response dated 24th of October, some of the information in the scope of your request is held, and this information is withheld under section 26. Well, they, didn't, they never said some of the information in the scope of our request is held. They always denied it, flat out denied it. So that's another lie. So section, section 26, six. just to rehash that, is like um, After Homeland Security can't release type information. Is that what the that is? Public disclosure. Um, not to disclose is, is not in the public interest, basically, yeah, defense. Yeah. Okay, national security right. is what Section 26 is. Yeah, yeah. I love that For their the answers, uh, the way they use the word scope. If I were to put my yes. lawyer hat on, they're not saying that the information doesn't exist. They're saying they consider it outside the scope. Yeah, in the scope of your request. Yeah. Right. But when they double check, they still deny that they hold any information when clearly they Within do. Within the scope. <laughs> yes, in the scope. If you go to the next one, which is a joint forces command, um, we wrote to them, why were the soldiers carrying automatic weapons that did not have yellow caps in the end of the barrel, implying they were carrying live rounds? And they said information is withheld under section 26, however, under section 16, duty to provide advice and assistance, we wish to be aware that military personnel were using blank simulated ammunition for this exercise. Mm. And then we went on, you know, men wearing forensic white paper suits were seen searching the fields. So if there was a risk of contamination to the team, was there not also a risk to local residents? MOD holds, holds no record of contamination associated with this exercise. No exercise has ever been listed for these people to this date. Mm. And finally, why were the military in the fields of Penturk during this time? Not Vodafone, not a fracking survey team the military, and this information is withheld under Section 26, not in the scope of, withheld. Yeah, so if it was Vodafone, it wouldn't be held with, under Section 26 because it wouldn't fall under that it wasn't exclusion. Vodafone. Only yeah. the military can hide behind Section 26, but I needed them to say it, and I got them to say it. Right. And they denied any knowledge of these people in the fields twice, we then get a section 26. Mm. Not very well done on their part. No, no, they're crap. Excuse my language. <laughs> so <clears throat> one of the questions we asked them was, if this was just an exercise, why did they lie about their identity and give a fake cover story as to their presence? And what, why, what were they doing in the fields of Penturk? When approached by local residents, they impressed upon them that they were civilians even though some were dressed in military attire. No planning permission had been granted for this campsite in these fields, but they were civilian tents and vehicles, not military. Again, I ask, why did they lie about their identity if this was just a military exercise? And a search for the information is either completed within the Ministry of Defence, and I can confirm that some of the information in the scope of your request is held. However, all of the information falls entirely within the exemptions provided for section 26. Mm. So I knew that this couldn't possibly be true. I know a little bit about the military and their rules and regulations. So I decided I'd find 
their rules, their regulations, their standing orders. And I have I have read the whole, the lot. But there was one document in particular that I was very interested in, and it's the next one, the Training Over Private Land Act. Mm. And this is for the Ministry of Defence, by the Defence Infrastructure Organisation, the people in charge of the military. And the first thing I went to, which will be your very next slide, is identification. All members of the services must disclose their identity and that of their unit if asked to do so by landowners and officials of national parks or forestry commission. It may not always be possible for landowners and officials to be readily recognised, but any persons questioning service personnel on private land must be assumed to have a valid reason for doing so. Therefore, the utmost courtesy must be extended to them. Parties of service personnel or individuals are not to avoid any person attempting to question them. But they did, and they lied. This was not an exercise. This was a covert military operation. Mm -hmm. um, next is what they should do for an exercise of this magnitude. Uh, there must be a ministerial briefing in advance about large-scale military exercises involving extensive areas of the UK, including training over private land. And the submission must include the period of the exercise, including weekend activities, times of the exercise, including any nighttime activities, the number of troops, vehicles and helicopters, any extensive out of hours, helicopters and fast jets activity, any foreign forces involved, you guys were involved over there, the Americans. Uh, details of any open days or media briefings. How the exercise might affect the general public. Well, believe me, they were affected because nobody knew. And a draft letter for the minister to send to members of parliament and members of devolved legisla legislators whose constituents are likely to be affected by the exercise activity. Well, nobody knew anything. The Welsh government didn't know. Local government didn't know, and certainly the press didn't know, because they were still working on a story about it at 3.39 in the morning. So they didn't plan it. Yeah, not an exercise. There's no denying that this is all extremely suspicious. Yeah, no right. exercise. So this was a letter to the Welsh government. Again, reference numbers are on there if people want to look this up. The Welsh government neither manages military exercises in Wales nor holds a record of any military exercises held in Wales by date, so they weren't able to help us. So then we wrote to local government, uh, which is the very next one, uh, the Rhonda Cunning Taff Council. I'm researching the incident on the night of the 25th and 26th of February 2016, which involved the supposed military exercise which took place in the area around Clantris and Common to Penturk, an area within which the Royal Glamorgan Hospital and the Royal Mint are located. Did the council have prior warning that the exercise was taking place? And if so, how much notification was given? And they said that the authority was not made aware of any exercises in this area on these dates and was not aware of any council property being damaged. So they were not told. There was no letter to... Right. right? Or and the damages. next one is... What Wells Online said at 3.39 in the morning that they were cu currently still working on a story about this. So there absolutely was not a press briefing. Yes. Uh, Kaz, I need to take a quick break. I need to uh, take a potty break. Yeah, okay. I'll still be here. Do okay, you, two Do minutes. you call it potty in where you live? <laughs> okay, so in the next slide. Um, yeah, keep up with her, Chad. <laughs> right, sorry. Thank you for we guiding him. To, yes, please. Uh, we wrote to South Wales Fire Service. Surely they would know something because there's huge explosions going off in a residential area. And they didn't know anything either. I think maybe so I'm the on the wrong service. slide. I just hit next. It says no mainstream media briefing. That South Wales, that's what they said. Oh, that was there. Do you remember I pointed it out in the yes. comments? So they checked with them. They they're saying still they're still working on a story out at 3.39 yeah. in the morning. So should I move so, on from this slide? Yeah, to the next one. Okay, here we go. Which is South Wales Fire Service. And we requested any information that they had 
regarding the alleged exercise that took place on the 25th and 26th of February 2016. And following an investigation, the service holds no information in relation to this matter detailed in your, in your request. So the fire service didn't know anything, even though there were huge explosions going off in a residential area next to the Royal Mint, next to a hospital, next to an industrial estate. So they weren't told anything. Mm -hmm. We asked the hospital, which is the next slide, could you please provide me with what emergency measures, services and procedures were undertaken? And information was passed to the Royal Morgan Hospital and military personnel during this time of the, explo the explosion happened. And no emergency measures or services and procedures were undertaken as no information was passed to the Royal Glamorgan Hospital about this exercise. So the hospital didn't know either. God forbid that anybody was having neurosurgery that night because the entire hospital shook and nobody yeah, knew. Geez. Well, going back to uh, the Training Over Private Land Act, uh, Section 30A, B and D, this is still part of the, the ministry's rules and regulations, the use of ammunition and pyrotechnics, and I'm, there's a reason why I'm going to go through these quickly. Special attention is to be paid to any restrictions imposed by the landowner on the use of blank ammunition, pyrotechnics or other training materials. When permission has been given for the use of live ammunition or pyrotechnics, units are to warn the local police and on no account should red flares be used for any training purpose. Because that's what my not so learned friends are alleging. That's what I saw flares. On no account should red flares be used for any training purpose. They weren't flares. So I do believe that a Miss Martin, who did this independently, set a freedom of information request into the Royal Air Force, asking, I would like to request information regarding the alleged exercise chameleon that took place in Penturk and Clantrison area of South Wales on the 25th and 26th of February 2016. Can you tell me, were any aircraft flares set off during this exercise? If so, what time were they? They set off, and if so, what location were they set off? A search for the information has now com been completed within the Ministry of Defence, and I can confirm that no information in the scope of your request is held. No flares were used. But it gets better. We go to the next slide. Again, what they should do for an exercise of this magnitude. A detailed recce and written consent. Once authority has been given, it is the unit's responsibility to carry out a detailed recce, decide upon the suitability of the area, obtain the owner's written consent. Uh, a, the written consent must reach the brigade a minimum of 21 days before training is due to start. And the brigade can authorise training as soon as the owner's written consent is received. Well, funnily enough, the owner in this case was National Resources for Wales, which is the very next slide. And we wrote to National Resources for Wales. I'm writing in respect to, to uh, your follow-up request for information dated 23rd of February 2018. Uh, why was Smilog Woods closed to the public during this time, February 25th and 26th, 2016? What exactly was the reason for the military being in Smilog Woods during this time? Whose authority was it to close the woods to the public during this time? And why were the roads closed down in the areas of Huntresson and around Smilog Woods during this time? And they answered us. There was no permission granted to the military to close the woodland and the public paths and let off explosives in the woodlands mentioned during these dates or in fact any dates. So we have no records. This type of activity would have required permission. So if it had occurred, we would have had a record. Therefore, Regulation 124A, Environmental Information Regulation 2004 applies. Information not held. So they did not get permission from the landowner, without which no exercise could ever take place. Mm -hmm. All right? But it gets better again. This is where the hospital changed their story. Mm. 
We asked them on the 26th of February 2016, a military exercise took place in the area around the Royal Glamorgan Hospital. You stated in a previous Freedom of Information that no notification was given to you. I have since discovered that a large explosion took place sometime after 4 a.m. on the same date. Sometime after this, security were notifying concerned employees and staff at the Royal Glamorgan Hospital that this was an exercise and that hospital services were not required. So, as you had no prior notification, could you please answer the following questions? Who notified the hospital by telephone after 4 a.m. on the 26th of February that their services were not required after the explosion? And who notified the hospital security that it was a result of a military exercise? And how? Uh, and they wrote and said, oh, please accept our apologies for the previous response, but new information has come to light. We can confirm that the Health Board's Civil Contingencies Manager at the time was notified by South Wales Police in advance of the exercise. Further to notification, the switchboard and security were informed of the event that no involvement would be required. So they so all of a sudden them. found information <laughs> years right. after the new, event. New yeah. information has come to light. So we asked them for proof of this prior notification because obviously this needs investigating. And clearly I know the truth. So funnily enough, the freedom of information request where they deliberately tried to merge the military and the police exercise together has vanished. There is definitely uh, evidence of absence, shall we say. But we do have our reply. And this is what we said. In your reply, you referred twice to the police counterterrorism drill and not the military exercise we specifically asked you about. The police counterterror drill took place on June 16th of, of 2016, and the military exercise took place on the 26th of February 2016. I would like to think that there is some confusion at your end, and not the idea that perhaps the trusts were trying to deliberately merge these two separate exercises as one. We asked for specific details of the military exercise and not the police counterterrorism drill. If the trusts were given prior notification of the military exercise in February 2016, can the trust please provide details of that notification, including date and time? And they wrote back and said, I, ap I apologise for any confusion caused by our previous response to your information request. I bet they do. Um, to clarify, the Health Board's Civil Contingencies Manager at the time, who no longer works there, was notified by South Wales Police. We've taken an extract from the email, please see below. And I'm not a computer genius, but even I can type in a different colour font. <laughs> South Wales yeah. Police have known so far that they will be conducting two counter-terrorism exercises 11pm to 3am on the 25th and 26th of February 2016 and all day on the 21st of June. There is no mention of a military exercise. We have used the wording that was in the email sent to staff regarding this exercise on the 25th and 26th of February. So now, did you seek out the uh, manager at the time? Oh, they won't speak to us. We've been to the hospital and we've, we've asked to speak to them and they absolutely refused to, to communicate with us whatsoever. But I did speak to hospital security because they told us um, that their records didn't go back to 2016. And mm. I spoke to hospital security and they assured me absolutely they do. They don't throw anything away. But you, didn't, you weren't I, able to track the name of the contingencies manager from that time and, and find him and ask him if any of this is true? No, they won't give us any details at okay. all under data protection. Yeah. They won't. Now, are so, you doing all of this yourself? Not my, No, Gary Jones um, is doing it with me, and we do have other individuals that are helping. Okay. Um, but we weren't going to let the hospital off the hook that easily. Um, we asked them um, about the military exercise, again, about proving that they had this email. And basically, they this was an internal response. Um, and they upheld it and said that, you know, they weren't giving out names and all the rest of it. As per the previous response, an email was issued by our civil contingencies manager at, uh, sorry, in post at the time to all relevant staff at 1556 on the 12th of February 2016. 
This included the following extract and again the same blue font. The blue well, font that, is none nice. of the staff knew. No one knew. And the next slide after that are some of the phone calls made to South Wales Police that night. And I've highlighted the one that's uh, important at the moment. And that was a call from the ambulance service and the staff at the Royal Glamorgan Hospital who uh, could hear a helicopter uh, and also a loud bang. And they, they were wondering what was going on in that area. And they were advised that there was a uh, an ongoing military exercise. That's from South Wales Police. So the staff weren't told. That's another lie. It gets deeper and deeper. Them, when we pressed them for the email, they actually said, we would also like to reiterate, there are no requirements to keep details of notifications of exercises. So they don't even have the email that they supposedly <laughs> took an extract from. So if they don't have the email, how could they give us an excerpt? I wonder um, how the whoever is behind all of this military, what, whatever, is putting the pressure on an enterprise like a hospital to change their story and everything else. Because I, 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 it's hard for me to believe that the hospital, for example, is in on the whole UFO subject, right? So somebody's putting pressure on them, right? I would like to just say this. The journalist that wrote the two cover stories on the morning of the 26th of February left her job that she'd been doing for 15 years and nine months and took a new position at the Royal Glamorgan Hospital mm. as yeah. the communications officer. Yeah, that's odd. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's probably the new contingencies manager. Anyway. Moving on swiftly, because there's a lot to get through. Um, this is from the Royal Mint. And we asked them, because there were some allegations that perhaps this so-called alleged exercise was to do with the Royal Mint. Uh, and this is following our Freedom of Information request. Whilst we received prior notification of the training exercise you refer to from the Welsh Extremism Counter-Terrorism Unit, the Royal Mint had no involvement in respect to the exercise whatsoever, <clears throat> and our premises were not used in any way. The exercise had no impact on our security systems or alarms, and any road closures had no effect on us either. Well, we pressed them further, and they said, to, you know, to show us proof that they had prior notification. This is the Royal Mint. We have no paperwork or documented evidence of notification of this event. We were informed verbally and given the passing of time and the lack of written notification, were unable to be more specific as to the date and time of the notification. There are military-grade explosives going off outside their building, and nobody checked. This is the Royal Mint. Mm -hmm. I need anyway. to look more into the war Royal Mint. I don't know a whole lot about that, but based on what you said, it's very interesting. It's got to be heavily guarded. Regardless. Absolutely, it was heavily guarded. But it's also part of the Ministry of Defence's avoidance policy. And there are certain key establishments, let's say royal households and the Royal Mint, where you can't fly over without special permission. And so the For Royal example, Mint contains gold, treasure, like what? what is it exactly that's in there, you know? Prints it prints, makes the coins okay, for the okay. realm. It also um, has safety deposit boxes. It's one of the most, if not the most, secure building in Europe. It's like Fort Knox for us. I'm yes. not sure Fort Knox is a real thing anymore. Like what, what Fort Knox used to be for us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now it's all digital. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. At the moment. Um, so... This is getting on to South Wales Police because we knew who to ask now. You know, this Welsh extremism counter-terrorism unit. So 11 times we asked this question. I wish to request information pertaining to training exercises. Could you please confirm whether you were or weren't conducting counter-terrorism exercises in Clantreston or the local vicinity of South Wales 
between the 25th and 26th of February 2016. Um, what time or times did these exercises take place? Did these exercises take place and roughly for how long? Were the local population informed that counter-terrorism exercises were taking place during the requested time of birth? And can you please give any details about what equipment was used and how much um, did these exercises disturb the local population? That was our question, 11 times. And their response, huh, which was very long-winded, and I did give them a B plus because it was a good effort, but not good enough when we know the truth. The South Wales Police can neither confirm or deny it holds any information with regard to our request. Confirm or deny within the Freedom of Information request uh, document is a heading that either have to confirm they have the information or they deny they hold the information, but they cannot say we can neither confirm or deny. But they tried to hide behind the two exemptions of national security and law enforcement, which were neither a valid um, exemption. So I wrote back to them, which is the next one. Dear South Wales Police, thank you for your response to my freedom of information request requesting whether you conducted a counter-terrorism exercise on the 25th and 26th of February in the Flantreson area of South Wales. You quoted two exemptions, national security and law enforcement, having given your exemptions some consideration and wholeheartedly agreeing that national sh security should be a priority, I do not agree that your exemptions are valid in this case. You state, to disclose whether or not the information is held would undermine the force's capabilities, which consequently would be detrimental to their ability to deal with the ongoing terrorist threat we face. It would be counterproductive to place information in the public domain about any counter-terrorism exercises which would inform the general public, especially those with malintent, that counter-terrorism tactics, techniques and procedures would have been on display or will be in the future. Counter-terrorism operations by their very nature are fundamental to the safety and protection of the country and the public at large. Therefore, to confirm or deny the information is held negatively impacting tactic, tactics, techniques and procedures, which is not in the public interest. And if you go to the next slide, it continues with my letter that on the 28th of June 2016 in the Flantreson area of South Wales, you did indeed conduct a police counter-terrorism exercise in some disused warehouses adjacent to the Royal Mint and Flantreson Common. A letter was issued and sent to all residents of Flantreson and the surrounding areas to warn of this exercise in advance. Posters were also erected giving notice of the aforementioned exercise. Did the rules for national security and your ability to police not apply then, or indeed the public interest? This is just one example of police counter-terrorism exercises being announced in advance, where they were advertised on the mainstream media, on television and on local radio stations. Surely notifying people in advance, sometimes months in advance, would be a risk to national security. I'm asking about an alleged exercise that took place seven years ago and would in no way impact national security or your techniques and procedures. Police counter-terrorism exercises have always been announced in advance in every major city in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. They've also been announced on a Europe-wide counter-terrorism exercise in advance. This subject has never been a secret until now for these two dates specifically. You mentioned several times your tactics, techniques and procedures. I'm not asking about any of those, but here is a link to a video on YouTube where a senior police officer is giving a running commentary of your police in action during one of your counter-terrorism exercises. And it's a UK police launch major counter-terrorism drills in London, where the Queen was at the time. And the link is for the Assistant Commissioner herself. This is just one example, but there are many more which I can provide on request. I feel you are deliberately trying to avoid my question, which is reasonable. And if national security or your ability to police did not apply in the country's capital and in every major city in the United Kingdom and across the whole of Europe and the rest of the world, why then will you not answer any of my questions regarding the 25th and 26th of February 2016 
in the Thrantisson area of South Wales. And I'm not done yet. Kaz, I think you missed your calling. You should have been a, a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Well, Gary does call me Barrister Clark. Yeah, I see that. Uh, uh, I went on to say, if you do not answer my request, I will ask for an internal review, providing more evidence if necessary. If that fails, I will lodge a complaint with my police, with the Police Complaints Committee and my MP. In the famous words of the late great President J.F. Kennedy, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. The, good quote. the law requires that you answer me and the exemptions you have given have never applied. Police counter-terrorism exercises have always been advertised in advance on the mainstream news, in the media, on the internet and on the radio. I would appreciate a very quick and timely reply and not leave me waiting the lawful time allowed. This is a request that can be, that, so, sorry, this request is something that can be dealt with in quick time. And quick time they did deal with it. We asked for an internal review and they gave us an internal review. This was the question. I wish to request information pertaining to training exercises. Could you please confirm whether you were or weren't conducting counter-terrorism training exercises in Flantreson in the local vicinity of South Wales between the 25th and 26th of February. And they upheld their initial um, response with an internal review, uh, which is fair and impartial. Nothing is fair and impartial by a police force that is self-governing. And they went on to say, if you remain dissatisfied with the response, you have the right to direct your complaint to the Information Commissioner's Office using the attached contact details. Was some fool forgot to action those attached contact details? So Gary and I went to the ICO directly. And they don't take on everybody's case because they haven't, they can't. And we had to submit our evidence to the Information Commissioner's Office and they upheld our complaint and investigated South Wales Police for contempt and we won mm, wow right um thank you for your complaints and supporting information about the public body authorities handling of your request for information that's south wales police your complaint is important to us and is now eligible for investigation and they did indeed have to answer us or face two years in prison a £5,000 fine or both for every officer that answered our freedom of inform information request or refused to answer. And this came from Jeremy Vaughan, Chief of Police for South Wales Police. The reference number and case number is on the top there. And inquiries have been made to the Counter-Terrorism Unit and they have confirmed that they hold no information in relation to this. There were no police counter-terrorism exercises on those dates. So why did the hospital change their story? Mm. Why did the Royal Mint say that they were given prior notice in advance, even though they can't provide any documentation for it? And how is it the South Wales police were telling people it was a military exercise and didn't know themselves that it was supposed to have been a police counter-terrorism exercise on the night? But it gets better. We asked about road closures. I, I was talking about this earlier. A number of roads were closed off during the exercise because not done with South, South Wales Police just yet. And the Royal Glamorgan Hospital and Smilog Woods. Who exactly gave the order? Why was it necessary to close the roads? And whose job was it to close the roads during the time stated? And this came as a refusal under Section 14 of the Freedom of Information Act. Vexatious. Troublesome or worrisome to people. We're asking about road closures that happened eight years ago. Is that what and vexation us, means? They're telling us that's worrisome to people. Mm. So we asked for an internal review, and I hope that your viewers get this, because for me, this was hilarious. And I have to say, if this is the level of intelligence that we have got running our country, we're in trouble, big time. <laughs> we asked for an internal review, and they decided that, it wasn't a vexatious request. And their response was, we have been unable to locate any recorded information in relation to any road closures on the date specified. The officers involved have since left the organization and other inquiries have been unsuccessful. 
Mm. <clears throat> how do they know who's involved? If it didn't occur. If it didn't happen, how do they know who's involved? So again, they're lying. They clearly know. I am vexatious. Bob. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. I learned a new word and I'm using it incorrectly. It's fine. <laughs> Anyway, going back to this document, which is training over private land. Um, you've all seen the cover of that before. Yes. I just want to get into a couple of the rules and regulations. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay. Next slide. Regulations of noise, right? Training over private land. Units must pay particular attention to the pre prevention of noise, especially during silent hours. Silent hours, like 4.30 in the morning, yeah? Mm -hmm. Similarly, exercises are not to be planned in areas where disturbance would be caused to local inhabitants in their homes. Perhaps they'd like to explain to all the residents of Flantrescent and Bather in Ponticlean why they were hovering their helicopters low over their houses at 4.30 in the morning. These are their rules, not mine. But the biggest one for me is the avoidance policy. <clears throat> These are their words. There are no uninhabited areas of the UK large enough to meet our essential training needs. In principle, the whole of the UK is available for low flying by military aircraft to provide sufficient training for airspace, whilst reducing the potential for disturbance as far as possible. In practice, Military low flying is not conducted in certain areas. In particular, our aircraft do not conduct low flying within the controlled airspace surrounding civil airports. Cardiff International is just up the road. And also to avo avoid overflying centres of population of more than 10,000 inhabitants. Clantrison alone has over 13,000. But this gets better. In addition, there are restrictions placed on the overflight of specific industrial, medical, and other key establishments. Royal Glamour. Medical yeah. is a hospital. <laughs> yeah. the, the Royal Mint is a key establishment, I would think which so. also sits on an industrial estate. And they broke every rule. They totally ignored the government's own avoidance policy, which is so serious. It involves royal households. Moving on to the uh, next slide, which is the public right of way. And there's a reason why I'm coming to this. Uh, okay, service personnel on foot are entitled to use the public facilities the same way as civilians, but must not monopolize the area. If a public right of way covers an area of private land used for training over private land, it must remain open to the public. There is no legal mechanism to close a public right of way for an exercise. But those men in Smilog Woods were arrested, detained, assaulted, illegally searched and removed forcibly from that area. I must say these are some good rules that they have for the public interest, they're not following them. Because it wasn't a public exercise. But they're good written rules. I, I wonder if we have anything like this or if... You would think so. I would hope so. Well, the next slide are my questions to the Ministry of Defence. Uh, the Freedom of Information reference number is at the top there for this multi-billion pound operation. What person, organization, or public body did you receive written permission from to conduct this exercise over private land? The Ministry of Defence holds no information. What information was given to the local community or local government for such a loud and disturbing exercise over a congested area? The MOD holds no information. Were any restrictions placed upon you by the landowner, organization, or public body prior to this exercise? The MOD holds no information. What written permission did you have to, to land your helicopters in silent hours in a congested area? The Ministry of Defence holds no information. And can you supply a copy of the detailed recce, including a photocopy of the map and routes? And would you believe it? The Ministry of Defence don't have a single piece of paperwork to back this up. 
Mm. Not one. Not one. For a multi-billion pound operation. Mm. They didn't have written permission. They broke every rule in the book. This is no, no small thing. This is massive. I want to get on to the subject of the NOTAM, which is a notice to airmen. And it's been a sticking point with some of what I call my not-so-learned friends for some, some time now, because a NOTAM was issued, but not on the night. It was issued the next day and then added. But the first slide is regarding the two aircraft that were in the skies of Penturk before the event. And it took them nearly three years to answer this. And these are two separate freedom of information requests. The reference numbers are at the top for everybody. Uh, I sent this off on the 28th of September 2018. After nearly two years and six months, I have not seen or been notified of any reply, which you are lawfully required to do between 20 and 40 days. Military planes were seen circling on the 23rd and 24th of February 2016 in Tlantrison and Penturk. Why was no no time issued for these dates? And the Ministry of Defence told us they held no information. Within so the we scope. Wrote again. There's that Could word you again. you please tell me why your plane ZZ418 Hawker Beechcraft was seen spotted by witnesses flying in circles and figure eight formations in Penturk, South Wales from the 22nd of February 2016 to the 26th of February 2016. This plane was also identified on public internet flight radar web websites and this information was withheld under Section 26. No no time was ever issued for that those aircraft and no exercise was ever listed. Well, on the MOD website, which is the next slide, you'll see these, these are the official exercises that were listed by the Ministry of Defence. And all of these exercises have a commencement date because they're planned. You know, MOD added an exercise on the 10th of March to commence on the 14th of March. One added on the 4th of March to commence on the 7th of March. But the one on the 25th of February 2016 was added and there is no commencement date. Every single one has a commencement date because they're planned. And that's on the official MOD website. Another mistake. So there was a NOTAM that was issued and you'll see it here. On the left is a map of the NOTAM and there's a, a red circle right in the centre of the map on the left uh, which is the boundary of that no time, uh, which would be the yellow circle that you see on the map on the right. That is the boundary of the no time. All air traffic is supposed to come across the estuary, which is shown on the map on the left. No aircraft are supposed to exceed a no time boundary. In fact, they're not allowed to fly within three nautical miles of its boundary. But they exceeded that no time by over 50 miles that night, something they would never do in an exercise, continuously pushing those objects west. The yellow pins on the map on the right-hand side are from phone calls and complaints by members of the public multiple times, multiple witnesses, multiple complaints. They went through Port Talbot and uh, Neath and Swansea all, and Gowerton and all the way out to sea. 50 miles outside of that no time, something they would never do. But I wanted to find out more about this no time. So we spoke to the National Air Traffic Services and we asked them, I'm making a request for information on a no time that was listed for exercise chameleon conducted on the 25th and 26th of February in the area in which this took place was South Wales in the UK. Could you please tell me the following. Uh, what did this application, sorry, what time did this application made for the note, was the application made for the no time? Uh, I can hardly read this. Could you please provide a list of what aircraft were involved and were listed? Uh, at what time was the official no time uh, get, uh, issued for this area? And could you please provide a map for the no time outlining the borders and boundaries 
uh, for said exercise. This is a National Air Traffic Services. And they wrote back to us and told us that they have been unable to find any information re regarding this specific nota. No information. This is the National Air Traffic Services. So the next slide is the Ministry of Defence. These were the people that allegedly posted this nota. And we asked them about it. And they said a search for the information that had been completed within the Ministry of Defence, and I can confirm that no information in the scope of your request has been found. However, under Section 16, Advice and Assistance, I can advise that the MOD submits no terms for certain military exercises to the Civil Aviation Authority at least five days prior to a military exercise. Five days. So we wrote to the Civil Aviation Authority, which is the next slide. Same questions. What time did this exercise application made for the NOTAM uh, to be placed in this area for that particular exercise? Could you please provide a list of what aircraft and vehicles were listed as part of that NOTAM used for exercise chameleon on said date? At what time did the official NOTAM get issued for this area? And could you please provide a map for the NOTAM outlining the borders and boundaries for said exercise? And this is the Civil Aviation Authority. These are people in charge of your aircraft when you're flying off on your holidays. And your request has been considered in the line with the provision of the Freedom of Information Act 2000. Following a review of held information, it has been determined that the CAA holds no information within the scope of your original request. Again and again and again. So they didn't know. Which is interesting. Which meant that the NOTAM was never planned. Right. This is... Uh, uh, just an excerpt from one new primary witness that came forward who's a resident of Penturk. Um, on Friday the 26th of February 2016, I was awoken in the middle of the night by loud aircraft noise and very bright lights. I looked out of the bedroom window over towards the fields behind the primary school in Tinicoy Woods. I was concerned that the lights were so bright and the noise so loud I thought an aircraft was crashing in the fields due to the low height. I continued to watch from the window at the bright lights combination of very bright white lights and red lights, trying to work out what was happening when literally the lights went and the aircraft went. I couldn't decide whether to go, it, it had gone to ground or flew off. It happened quickly where I was and looked as if one went to ground. I couldn't make out at the moment the amount of aircraft that the lights were blinding, but there were a few by the different engine noises. I stayed still watching waiting for signs of a crash to decide whether to go out and help. But I could not see any smoke or signs of a crash. It was bizarre, as we have very little sleep in our house. But the children did not wake it to this and slept all night. It was the only night since 2007 I have not had a child awake. This is something that still stands out as being very odd for me, this t sorry, for us. And it's still the only night our children didn't wake. What do you think accounts for that? I think something else was going on that night. I, I can't say what exactly, but certainly there was something else going on. Mm. Yeah, it's you know, odd. Um, it is odd because this person has three disabled children and they always have a child awake, whether it's one or two. Um, but on that night, they slept right through. This, this person saw the top of the pyramid from the adjacent street above the rooftops of the houses, but it gives you an indicator of how how low those planes, those aircraft were. In fact, the C-17s were flying wingtip to wingtip. They broke minimum heights and minimum safe separation distances as set out by aviation law. You know, this is no small thing. Right. The helicopters hovering low over people's homes um, People were eyeballing the pilots as they looked out of their bedroom windows. You know, we have minimum heights for a reason. And they broke every rule in the book that night. And the only way they'd be able to do that and get away with it is if it's a real combat situation. That's the only time aviation law does not apply. Moving on quickly, because I've almost come to the end of these slides. This was a public statement made by the Cole Winston witnesses who took the photographs. 
A family living in Colwinston, a village in a rural city, uh, setting situated southeast of Bridge End, was awoken just after 2 a.m. by their house vibrating. The house felt like it was shaking, and the noise never heard anything like it in my life. Very strange noise, almost felt like it was a static feeling. The dog was barking and described by witnesses as bonkers behaviour, which was not characteristic. Through the window, the witnesses saw a large object fly over the house roughly west to east, just over the rooftop. The object displayed a row of orange and red lights and its underneath surface had a light green hue. A green yellow light, sorry, a green light glow was seen leaving the main group of lights and this descended into the fields in an area southeast of Colwinston. During this time, the witnesses managed to take several photographs on a mobile phone. About six to seven minutes later, several aircraft were heard flying overhead, bright lights were seen, and what were thought to be Apache helicopters were heard flying around, which were dark and did not display any navigation lights at 2.33 a.m. These were heard circling the area where the green light had gone down for five to six minutes. These aircraft headed off towards northeast, roughly in the direction of Plantricent and Penturk area, then all went quiet and the witnesses went back to bed. Following the incident, the official explanation that this had been a military exercise persuaded the witnesses that this had been the case. But recently, on learning of the incident at Penturk, the witnesses decided the times and dates of the photos and realised that the incident they had experienced was on the same night and therefore must be linked in some way. And the next one, from the Ministry of Defence Secretariat. The only higher authority is the King, and I have written to him too. I wish to make a freedom of information request. Please could you tell me or confirm any information is held within the Ministry of Defence or the Defence Infrastructure Organisation or any office that would hold information pertaining to any day or night military exercises or day or night low flying exercises for the area of South Wales for the time of February of 2016. I'm treating your correspondence as a request for information under the Freedom of Information Act. A search for the information has now been completed within the Ministry of Defence and I can confirm that no information in the scope of your request is held. There were no programmed air defence exercises in South Wales in February of 2016. So what were they doing here? And how did I know it was not an exercise on the morning of the 26th of February 2016? And that's the Secretariat. Mm. And finally, finally, the photographs. These are some of the objects mm. that came out of the pyramid that night. The metadata is in the middle there. 2.33 a.m on the 26th of February, 2016. Those look like uh, what you've described. These those are the, those are are the, ba- the barrels, the right? You're right. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Look at that. That looks like almost like flying jelly beans over here. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, they, were, they were quite large. I mean, they were the size of a smart car, you know. Yeah, yeah. Not a caddy. No, that's far too big. But about the size of a smart car, yeah. Well, those are interesting. So the Pentoke yeah, incident China. was real. And all of these naysayers and alleged ufologists that are in denial on this case need to wake up and smell the coffee. Are there ufologists that are in denial? Like yes. well-known ufologists? Well, I wouldn't know if they're well known because I'm not one. So can I don't you know. Name, can any you name names? Really, um, I can't name names. That would be unfair. But it's quite clear this was not a military exercise. That was the cover story. The second story to cover the cover story was that it was a police counterterrorism exercise, and it wasn't one of those either. At the end of the day, this happened. That this was real. And right now, yes, we have written to the King of England, King Charles, because he was here on that day. 
He was here with William. He was here with David Cameron, the Prime Minister at the time. Coincidentally, all at RAF St. Athen. Really? By 7.30 on the 26th of February, 2016. Wow. That is not a coincidence. Wow. We've had a whistleblower from Wright Patterson who said that the craft itself was taken there from South Wales. Always. And we know that the Royal Plane flew from RAF St. Athen to America that very day. Hmm. Always right. This was real. Yeah. You know, I took three polygraph tests and passed with the leading forensic polygraph examiner in the country who tests the government. They test the, they test the military. You know, this is not some backstreet, oh, I'll bung you, you know, 500 pounds, give me a certificate. This was the real deal because I wanted people to know I told the truth. And I am not the only witness. You know, we've got Jacob Coleman now who's come forward who saw the green object in a standoff with the Apache helicopters. We've got uh, another witness now who will be coming forward publicly for the first time in the presentation that I do on the 7th of March. So it's coming up. Um, so I won't mention his name just yet. But again, saw the pyramid from underneath. Saw it. We have uh, a witness in North Wales and his wife at 4.40 in the morning saw the pyramid fly over the causeway in Colwyn Bay, arcing up into space. And I asked him, what were you doing up at 4.40 in the morning? And he said that they'd been rushed into hospital with their six-month-old baby boy, and they'd just been given the clearance to come home. And that's why he was up. Mm. And he too has, coming, has gone public. We have the men in Smilog Woods that saw the object on the ground, felt and heard the explosion. The whole mountain shook. He described it as standing on a vibration plate that the whole mountain went poof, you know, for about two mm -hmm. seconds. Um, we know that the, the police closed the roads there into Smilog Woods for several days. So how we got in without being detected is beyond me um, because they must have been around the woodlands to make sure nobody could get in. But we got in. But then we kind of hacked our way into the woods, if you like, and not we didn't take a road into Smilog. Um, because I knew the trajectory of the green object. We were looking for the debris trail, if you like, you know, with all the canopies of the trees out. And it came in at an ever-descending height into that area. Um, we went up on the 26th. I uh, didn't follow the debris trail through to its end. Um, because of me, really. Because I, I was exhausted. I needed a drink, you know. It was hard going, it's not easy. And so we come back to my home and we told everybody else what we'd found and we planned then to go up the next morning uh, with cameras and follow the debris trail through to its end and that's what we did. And the morning of the 27th, my hair turned completely white. Wow. Completely white. Yeah, that's crazy. So... That whole thing is crazy. Yeah. So I must say that with everything that you've presented here, there's really not any doubt. No. Right? Right. So, so what now? Mm. Like, I know you're not going to well, convince just, everybody because there's going to be people that are going to hold out no matter what you present. But right. uh, we have a petition out at the moment mm -hmm. uh, to follow along the lines of what America are doing um, for full disclosure on UAPs and non-human intelligences to try and stay in line with what Congress are trying to do. So the petition is live now, and they've wriggled. They, they really tried not to let us have that, but it is live. Uh, we've also written to King Charles um, because I know that he was here that day. I know that he saw it without any doubt. And we've used the Penturk incident as the example um, to order the UK government to instigate a process of disclosure in this country. And I'm not going to stop until we get it. Yeah, That's the bottom line. I'm not stopping. I don't know what everybody else has been doing, no disrespect, guys, um, in this country. Ufologists that have been ufologists for 30 and 40 years, other than being self-serving, what have they done to, to progress this disclosure? What have they done to try and get disclosure? Nobody else has written to the king, ever. I have. And I'm deadly serious about it. We've been to the Home Office. 
We've been to the Secretariat of the Ministry of Defence. I hauled South Wales Police over the coals and won. Okay, yeah. I had them facing criminal charges. How ironic. And I'm not stopping until somebody gets accountable or is held accountable for coming out here and threatening me and my kids. That's my bottom line. Yeah, you know, you're exactly right. Um, cause we deal with this all the time and we have yeah. this debate here on this show all the time. We have these talking heads of the, of ufology that are always putting out these things that are, you know, uh, vague and it never points to anything. And we're always kind of Just hoping left. there are, yeah. you know there what are I mean? a lot of stories, a lot of stories yeah. and that's exactly what they are stories. I've had to evidence and fight and fight my entire life. I've had to fight, and they chose to fight the wrong person. I'm afraid. Yeah. Because I'll do it. And um, I can see I've that. Had evidence, <laughs> yeah, evidence. Very I well said, documented. You know, I took on the Ministry of Defence and won. I took on South Wales Police and won. You know, we we. I'm not stopping until we get a process of disclosure in this country, and the Penturk incident, if given the right backing, could be the catalyst. To actually get disclosure. So let me ask because you more because and more people I'm are coming forward. We we go on Reddit all the time. It has a big, huge com UFO community and debates and this and that and the other thing. And this, the Pentrick incident, never comes up there. Why do you think that is? Right. Look, I've been shadow banned for eight years. People still find it very difficult to find me, and it's not that I'm not there. Um, there are a handful of people that call themselves ufologists. And they have an instant dislike of me, uh, whether that be because they're misogynists, I don't know. But certainly, I'm the first to admit that I had PTSD at the beginning of this and didn't know because it was happening to me. And it was only really when I ripped into that commanding officer that came out and tried to move us on that I suddenly realized after I'd taken a breath, oh my God, Kaz, that's not you. What's happening? You know, that there was something wrong with me that I'd gone from zero to a hundred and I'd really, you know, ripped into this poor man who stood there in, in, in shock really. Um, and so I'm the first to admit that I was probably one of the hardest people to, uh, to work with because I had that fight or flight mentality. I didn't want to come forward and I, I was always coerced to come back to tell them more, you know, um, and then to find out that these people had betrayed me and had put my name online along with the other witnesses that they knew about at the time. Um, I couldn't trust them, so I walked away from them. And so I took their story, if you like, with me. Um, and ever since then, even though th these people are sitting on primary evidence for this case, they've seen the video that the witness still holds. When, you know? Will that video ever be released? I don't know, because I don't know what they've said about me. I think the implication was that I, I did this for money and that um, I haven't made any money out of this, boys, you know, at all. In fact, I have a chosen charity. I don't even collect money. And my chosen charity is AP Cymru, so if anybody would like to give money, that's a, a charity for autistic children. Mm. I've even taken my website down because there are other nefarious websites out there that are raising money in my name. When you first yeah. came on our show, <laughs> when you first came on our show and we were trying to link to your website and I had to email you back and forth and say, I'm finding this other website where this person is taking PayPal donations. I don't think this is right. you. And you confirmed yeah. that's not me. Yeah. I'm not taking yeah. donations directly. And, but they had their whole website, you know, organized in such a oh, fashion yeah. that you would think right. that was Kaz. Mm. So I've taken my website down um, because I don't want to be associated with that. If people want to give money, give money to charity. You only got to open your front door and look down the street because what, for me, you know, as, as a Christian, and I am a Christian, we were given one commandment to love each other. Love each other. You know, to, if we extended that hand of help to everybody, there'd be no starving in the world instead of giving money to these big organizations that pretend they'll give money to the starving, and yet the people are still starving. You know, so where's the money? Um, I don't know what we've become, what, 
you know, I feel resp a big responsibility. It's a huge burden, not only for all of us and for you and your kids, you know, you and your families, and for me and my family, but to them. Because somewhere, somehow, we are connected. On a spiritual level, we are connected. We are part of them and they are part of us. And I questioned from day one, were these the gods of old? You know, is that where the pyramid idea came from? Mm. Were these the angels of light? Because there are no descriptions of them. They're just lights. And yes, I was communicated with. And I don't know if that was audible, that David heard it, or if it was just in my head, but it was a man's voice, not my voice. Tell the world what you witnessed here. A simple message. Right. And what did we do? I'm appalled at what happened that night. I'm sickened by what happened that night. Because they weren't hostile. If they were, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. It's as simple as that. So you mentioned that you have a um uh a briefing, if that's the right word, coming up on March seventh. Where where is that? What's the venue? Uh, it's in Guadalajara, um, locally. It's okay. sold out, unfortunately, um, in five minutes. I I don't charge normally at all. It was the owner of the property, and he asked me for a ticket price, and I said five pounds. Simple as that. Make it as low as possible, because if you put on a free event. Nine times out of ten, people are always free. I'm not going to bother, you know. Uh, I'm tired today. I've just come home from work. I can't be asked. That type of attitude. Yeah, yeah. But as a token payment of just a fiver, if right. they paid it, I might as well go. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't charge for presentations, and I don't do presentations very often. But I was approached by this person, this owner, asked me if I would do a presentation, and I don't think he had any idea of how big it is. Mm. Um, and tickets went on sale at 10 a.m. And by five past 10, they'd sold out. So are you like a, um, almost like a local celebrity at this point? I hope not. <laughs> really? <laughs> I hope not. Um, people know that I'm real and I speak from the heart. Right. And, you know, I, I, if there's a thread of evidence to follow, I will, I don't care who they are. I will go after them. You know, and that includes the Ministry of Defense or South Wales Police. So now you know, I, uh, I, I sort of vaguely remember from our first interview with you that I think it was either your neighbor or your friend who was ever with you and you both witnessed this and he was having like real problems afterwards with yeah. coming to grips with it. Um, is, have you mentioned his name? Is that David? I'm sorry, that I'm really David. bad with I'm, I'm really bad with this. Him. David is a pseudonym. It's not his real name. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, it still scares him very much, even today. You can see it in his face when you mention it. He is terrified, not of the UFOs, but of the Ministry of Defense. Mm. And I hit that head on. I knew exactly what was happening to me when they threatened me. And if the threats had stayed directly toward me, then maybe I wouldn't have said anything. But not my children. Yeah. I'm their protector. So have the threats I'll... stopped? Yes, touch wood. Let's hope they have. Yeah, yeah. But that's not to say that when I go out, I don't check underneath my car before I get in it. Mm. You know, and that's psychological warfare, isn't it? That's rough. You know, I've had strange people come and knock my front door and then when they see the cameras, disappear. Because mm. I've got security big time in my house. Mm. So I have to. That's how I live now. I don't want to have to live like that. That's yeah. what they did to me. Yeah, you know, I didn't choose you. this path. They chose me. Right. Uh, and this is real. You know? We're hoping that we may have video in the very near future. That would be I amazing. That, now, yeah, that would be great. Now you mentioned that would be the cherry on the top for me. Yeah, yeah. It would be undeniable. 
That would be amazing. So you mentioned that you talked to Ross Coldhart. Yes. Uh, we had him on our show, I think it's two years now, when his book In Plain Sight was coming out. So how did your discussion with him go? Uh, it was quite curt to begin with because the alleged UFO group that had been in contact with me initially had written to him and said, Ross, don't bother getting involved. It's all a fabrication. She made it all up. Mm. And then I contacted him. I didn't know about the email, of course. And I said to Ross, I said, do you seriously believe I would have contacted one of the best forensic investigative reporters anywhere in the world if this didn't happen? Because that would be suicide. Mm -hmm. Right. And he happened to agree with me. And so we sent him some of the evidence, Gary and I. And his attitude was completely different when I spoke to him next. He was, oh, my God, I had no idea there was so much evidence in this case. And, of course, you've only heard me. You've not heard any of the other witnesses yet, even though some of them have gone public with me. And I know that David did give an interview, but it was audio only, and his voice has been disguised mm -hmm. um, to Yvette Fielding. And that's the only person that he's given an interview to. And he had that fight or flight mentality that morning. And I said to him, look, you know, I'll be here with you. And it's just a Q and a So is there any chance of Ross Coldheart um, doing an interview with you, bringing it out, whether it's on his podcast or on one of his news I've programs? Asked him, I've asked him to investigate this case. Okay. And he has been for the last two years. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. So he's on it. That's good. At, yeah. uh, from the United States end, he wanted uh, he wanted some time to make some avenues, shall we say, mm -hmm. uh, over there with his contacts in in certain places. And I'm not sure if if David Grush wasn't a find of his on the back of this. Oh, interesting. Looking for retrieval teams. Interesting. Yeah, that'd be crazy. So this is, you know, it's a huge case. It's still growing. Yeah. We're still investigating. We're still waiting for certain freedom of information to come back that they are dragging their heels with, as they always do. Um, I think we're up to about three years now waiting for, which isn't the first time. And this is why this investigation has taken so long. Um, but it's about being persistent. And yeah. this is just a fraction, just a, just the tip of the iceberg of, uh, of the information that we have that I've given you today, just to sort of put it into some kind of order very briefly. But it goes into a lot more depth about the conspiracy, you know, and I always I address my audience be, to, to, to say, you know, you are my judge and jury. You're all my peers. Look at the evidence. You know, if, if a witness lies... You can accept all or part of what they say. But which part would you believe, if anything? If multiple witnesses lie under oath, it is a conspiracy to cover up the truth. So I let the people decide. Well, let me, uh, let me finish by, by saying that, I, and I think Bob's with me on this, we go back and forth every week. We have somebody on who convinces us the UFO issue is real. We have somebody else who comes on and debunks and convinces us it's not. And so we're constantly going back and forth. But the evidence, the stuff that you provided to us tonight is... Yeah, different. It's very detailed. It's very detailed. It's hard to refute. I don't know how you would. I mean, how can you? I mean, and even some of these individual pieces of information, like... Just the path of the of the plane over the area, mm -hmm. just that in itself is like, wh what possible purpose could that have? You know what I mean? For four days. And an above top secret uh, airplane doing that. Uh, so there's got to be something here. And I'm, I really look forward to, you know, I'm hoping, I don't know, to be honest with you, how much of us putting this out can forward it, but every little bit counts. You know, I'm no, hoping... People I'm, want to know more details, you yeah. know, and I'm not plugging the book here, but the first five years of the investigation is now available on Amazon, and if you've got Prime, it's absolutely free on okay. Kindle. 
so please get it. It's a little bit more expensive than a paper, uh, black and white. It's, it's full colour. It has to be. It's got images of the craft site in there um, that I've not shown you today. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's done because it differentiates between what I've typed and the freedom of information, our questions and their response. So it's in different colours so that the book makes sense. Uh, to take you through the first five years of the of the lies and contradictions and the number of lies that we've been told, because I've only given you a fraction today. Yeah. But there is so much more. I think we're up to about 150 freedom of information requests to mm. different agencies. You know, we spoke to all other health authorities, not just the one. Are they ever told about military exercises? They're never told unless they're involved. And if they are involved, they would go to a military base. They wouldn't do it at the hospital right. for obvious reasons. Um, so why would the Royal Glam be told if they've already admitted that they weren't involved? Yeah. Um, the whole thing is a cover-up. So and, I think um, um, the the um, the Reddit UFO community is fairly powerful in terms of they are getting um, – you know, topics related to this subject brought into light and more and more people talking about it and furthering it and becoming a, a big topic of conversation in the UFO community. We're going to post this there, this video, and we're going to yeah. suggest that people take more, uh, you know, view into it for lack of a better word at the moment. I absolutely invite everybody to investigate this case. Yes. And they do that. Get involved. Yeah. Get to the bottom of it. Investigate it. Ask questions. Be a nuisance. Do not accept the lies that you're first told because that's what they try and do. I know and I, because I was there. I saw it. But I want you to see it. I want you to know because this was real. Yeah. This happened. And it involves us all. It might have been half a dozen UFOs they shot down that night. But what implications does that have for us, for our planet, for our race? You know? Right. This needs to stop. And if they're a threat, we should be told. Correct. That's the bottom line. For better or worse, we should be told. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what this is all about for me, uh, finding the truth. Yep. You know. Well, um, my mind is blown. Mine as well. Bob's mind is blown. So, Kaz. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on and giving us this huge update. Like I said, we're going to put it out there as best we can. I'm going to put it on Reddit. I'm going to hope that it gets more traction over there. Uh, people start to debate it. And naysayers and believers alike, the bottom line is the more people that are talking about it, the more you know well it becomes known. So hopefully we can further that along. And, you know, let's have you back on when there's a third update. Uh, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. I'd, let's not leave it so long next time. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. And thank you for uh, accommodating our schedule. I know right over there right now it's, shoot, what time is it? It would be 2.37. 2.37 in the morning. You need to go get some sleep. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm on American time. I'm good. You know, good, I'm, good. Okay, good. Welcome. <laughs> We we, we give you honorary American citizenship. That's correct. We have that Thank power you. here in the hangout. <laughs> <laughs> All I right, wish Kaz. I'd be there. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. See you soon. Basement. All right.